Hello and a very warm welcome. I'm Samantha Simmons. I'm a BBC News presenter and journalist, and I'm delighted to be your host for this webinar. Well, the news agenda here has been dominated for the past few years by Brexit. The UK has, of course, now left the EU, but we still haven't concluded that all important trade deal. The latest deadline is just two days away. October the 15th is the date Boris Johnson gave the EU to secure a post-Brexit trade deal in order to ensure that both parliaments have enough time to ratify an agreement. There is much scepticism that that deadline will be stuck too. Well, there are few people in this country or possibly even the world better placed to take us through what we can expect from that deal and for the future EU-UK relationship. And our speaker today, I'm delighted to be joined by former Chancellor Philip Hammond. Philip, welcome to you. Before we get started, a reminder that you can also put your questions to the former Chancellor a little bit later, so please do post them on the Q&A page on the bottom of the screen. So let's begin. Philip, what is the future for the EU-UK relationship? Thank you, Samantha. Well, as you say, we are coming to a crunch point now. Uh, the EU summit later this week has been widely touted as the last chance to do a deal. To many people, it seems inconceivable that the EU and the UK would trade on WTO terms. So I think most people think that some kind of deal will be done. Um, uh, the risk uh, still is that there's a miscalculation on one side or the other, or both. Um, but the likelihood is that a deal will be done. But let me be clear that um, a deal being done is not the same as business going on as usual. And I fear that many British businesses have not understood that even if the British government were to get everything that it had asked for in this trade deal, um, there is still a big shock to the UK economy coming on the 1st of January. The, the, the deal that the government has asked for is essentially a tariff free deal for trade in manufactured goods. It doesn't deal effectively with agricultural produce. It doesn't do anything to secure access to European markets for Britain's huge services sector, including the crucial um, financial services um, sector. Um, it doesn't address the um, access for UK manufactured goods to third countries, which we currently access through the EU's trade agreements, where we haven't yet got trade agreements of our own in place. And crucially, um, it will be a trade deal. It will be uh, a trade agreement, not a single market agreement. So uh, goods will be subject to customs checks. They will be subject to rules of origin uh, controls. Goods that are manufactured in the UK have to have a certain content of UK um, produced value, not just be um, imported components um, assembled or repackaged. All of this is going to be quite a big shock for um, UK business and UK um, industry. So the likelihood is a skinny deal. What's the upside? What's the benefit of that? Well, look, the, the major benefit is that we will be in a continuing relationship with the EU, and that shouldn't be underestimated. Um, if we do a deal of any kind, the mood will lighten, the relationship will certainly um, improve, and it is possible perhaps um, that we will be able to build uh, a deeper uh, trade relationship over time. I'll come back to that. Evidence will probably show that um, the Europeans and the British have both exaggerated their fears about how the other will behave, and perhaps we will get gradually um, uh, get more confidence in the new relationship um, that we have between the UK and the EU. But the most important reason for having a deal, however small, is the appalling risks that attach to no deal. Apart from the disruption that that would be likely to cause to um, trade at the border um, and even further costs behind the border, as um, mutual recognition of professional standards, of um, uh, validation organisations ends, for example. Um, the danger is that if there isn't a deal, the hardliners in the UK will blame that on the EU and will make a case for withholding the financial settlement that was agreed by the Theresa May government 
a couple of years ago. And of course, if that happens, if the EU start to suspect that they may not get their money, then it will be a very, very different um, mood music to the relationship. And we can envisage a very, very bad tempered Brexit uh, indeed with uh, disruption at the borders, perhaps being uh, augmented by that frustration in European capitals. Um, a very difficult time for the um, settlement in Ireland. Um, if uh, we have a good trade deal with the European Union, then the, the arrangement that's been agreed over the Irish border can work. But if there is no trade deal and British goods um, going into Europe and European goods coming into Britain are subject to tariffs and controls, uh, then uh, necessarily uh, those kind of controls will have to be exercised uh, over goods flowing between um, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which will confront the UK government um, with a very big challenge um, indeed. Whether we get a deal or no deal, I think there is an expectation uh, that we will be able to build in the future a deeper trade relationship. Some people, particularly on the hardline Brexit wing, have been suggesting that if we don't get a deal by the end of the year, it doesn't matter that much because there'll be a deal next year for sure. I wouldn't be so certain about that. I think if we do not have a deal, the Europeans will adopt a strategy of allowing us to understand just how expensive that is um, and will want to wait a few years until they start negotiating again with the UK. They will want to see if British public opinion moves on this issue once the cost of no deal starts to become clear in people's pay packets. They'll want to see whether the political um, uh, dynamics in the UK change, whether perhaps the next general election might look as though it would bring forward um, uh, a political party that might be more committed uh, to a closer trading relationship um, with the UK. So I think um, we shouldn't expect that if there's no deal, we will be able to quickly resume negotiations for a deal. But if there is a deal, I think it is quite likely that we will be able to build incrementally upon it as confidence in the relationship grows on both sides. And that's probably, frankly, the best outcome uh, we can hope for now. Most uh, economists think that from an economic point of view, um, ultimately the UK and the European Union must have a close trading partnership. Um, and inevitably such a close trading partnership is going to be based on alignment between um, regulations and practices in the UK and the European um, Union. And the truth, of course, is that in most areas, British consumers, British businesses, British workers, British voters have no appetite at all for us diverging from European regulations and entering into some great um, uh, feeding frenzy of deregulation. Environmental protection, consumer protection, uh, worker protection in the workplace. Um, all of these things um, are very dear to the hearts of most British voters, as they are to most European voters, and they are not likely to change um, whatever happens. What about the UK's relationship with other countries and um, potential third country trade deals? Well, um, the biggest impediment to most of these third country trade deals is um, in fact regulations around agricultural produce. And since we're not going to have um, an alignment with the European Union on agricultural produce, I don't think the type of deal that is now likely to be agreed is going to be an impediment to doing deals with third countries, uh, trade deals with third countries. Um, it's much more likely that the concerns of British consumers will be an impediment for example, to doing a trade deal with the US that allows US agricultural produce, all that chlorinated chicken and hormone fed beef uh, to enter uh, the UK market. Um, but for me, the challenge for the UK in setting about uh, creating its own trade deals is one of scale. The UK is a large economy, 
Um, but it's a dwarf by comparison with the blocs, the US, China and the European Union. And the reality of the modern world is that it is polarizing into power blocs. Of course, China and the US in a standoff on trade now as never before, uh, the two great economic superpowers. But the European Union as a single entity um, is in the same category in terms of economic size. The US and China are also strategic powers in a way that the European Union isn't. But many, many commentators think that it will be very, very difficult for a country of the size and scale of the UK uh, to ex uh, exercise the influence uh, and enjoy the prosperity that we've been used to as an independent player. And I give you as my example, Japan. Japan is twice the size of the UK, um, twice as big an economy, um, twice as large a population. And yet D Japan clearly does not have the influence uh, on um, global affairs that, for example, the UK um, has had traditionally. Um, and, and yet it's twice our size. So a real challenge for the um, UK going forward. I think in the end, we will have to align with somebody. I don't think personally that we are going to align with China. Uh, I think we will find it very difficult to align economically with the US because uh, our social welfare system, our um, regulatory system is so different from that which prevails in the US. The truth is, although my Brexiteer friends and colleagues hate it, that the UK is clo more closely aligned to the European Union than it is to any other large um, bloc of power. And I think geopolitics, as well as economics, will push us back towards some kind of relationship with Europe um, in the medium term future. And I'm going to end, if I may, with a prediction. My prediction is that 10, 15, 20 years down the line, um, the world will be polarized into three big power blocks. A Chinese block, which takes in a free trade area, a so-called free trade area um, of Southeast and Eastern Asia, um, a US-led bloc, and a European economic bloc, which includes the European Union, includes the UK, and the countries of the Eastern Mediterranean, North Africa, in a sort of Europe plus um, economic and security grouping, um, which is the only way uh, we will be able to keep ourselves safe and prosperous in the future. And I think the ambition should be, given where we now are, that Britain should be the clear leader of the non-EU part of that wider European and Mediterranean grouping in the future. That's a, that's a reasonable ambition for us to aim at um, that would keep Britain uh, um, a serious and important power in the world and keep the British people safe and prosperous. Okay, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm sure you could have talked an awful lot more, so I appreciate you stopping <laughs> to allow questions. Uh, I'm interested just short term, literally in the next couple of days, what you think is going to happen. Boris Johnson has said, whether it's rhetoric or not, that he is willing to walk away if a deal isn't reached by Thursday. Um, we've heard from the EU negotiating team today, they don't think a deal is going to be reached by Thursday and they're willing to plough on for the next few weeks. I mean, this is more high stakes gambling from Boris Johnson. Do you actually think he would walk away? And, and this comes back to the miscalculation point that I mentioned at the beginning. Um, you know, in a game of poker, the danger is that um, someone misreads the other side's um, poker face. Um, I don't think a deal will be done by Thursday. Um, I think there's still too much outstanding on state aid and uh, fishing in particular. Um, and I think an EU summit is probably not the right place for a deal to be done. Um, Boris, I, I know, has always had a, um, an ambition that there would be some great dramatic moment when the heads of EU governments assemble and he arrives and bangs the table and makes an impassioned speech and they all um, wilt into submission and a deal is done. I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it will run another few weeks yet. Uh, I think um, most people think that the absolute real backstop is probably around the second week of November. Um, if we haven't got a deal by then, everybody has to go um, 
full speed into preparing for the consequences and the shock, the, the much bigger shock that will hit the British economy on 31st of December. And how prepared do you think any of us are for whatever happens in the next few weeks, whether there is a deal or not, there will be a huge shift for anybody doing business with the EU? So a lot of British businesses did a lot of work, not enough, but a lot of work um, a year or 18 months ago, um, preparing for a no deal Brexit. My fear, and I'm afraid it's borne out by many conversations that I've been having, um, is that many British businesses think that this is binary. Um, if we don't have no deal, um, then we have a deal. And if we have a deal, things are broadly the same as they are now. That is not the case. There is not even a discussion going on about a possible outcome that would leave us um, uh, continuing with the kind of trading arrangements that we've got now. The trading arrangements will change. British trucks will have to produce um, uh, customs declarations at the border and foreign trucks coming here will have to do the same. Um, agricultural produce um, will not be able to move freely in, in any world. Um, financial services, um, if they're traded, will be traded um, uh, on the basis of a concession by the EU that can be withdrawn at any time, not a sustainable basis for a multi-trillion dollar um, business. So there will be very significant change if a deal isn't done, but there will be significant change even if a deal is done. And I fear British business really hasn't quite absorbed that yet. And I'm sure it's a very long answer to my next question, but if you can perhaps summarise, what should businesses be doing now? Um, I think business, so the problem is a psychological one that many businesses will say, look, we've been marched up this hill several times already and marched down again. We are just not prepared. Um, to invest time, energy, capital, until we know what the outcome is. Um, and I understand that, but I think businesses have to at least prepare for the best case scenario, which is that we do the, the deal that's under discussion, the skinny deal. Um, and if they prepare for that, they will still have more work to do if there's no deal, but at least they will have understood the scale of what they've got to do um, in the event that a deal is agreed as we move from transition, which is effectively the same as being in the EU, to um, our new trading relationship on January the 1st. And how will ordinary people be affected by whatever comes our way in the next month or so? Well, there will be some disruption, um, I suspect, um, much more disruption if it's a no deal outcome. But even in a deal, there will be some disruption of supply chains as they adapt to the new arrangements at the borders and the new restrictions and regulations. Um, there'll be some disruption of financial services. For example, um, British banks have already started telling long-standing um, account holders who live in Europe that they may have to close their accounts on January the 1st and vice versa for European banks with account holders in the UK. Um, so there will be that element of disruption. And then to the extent that the arrangements at the border and behind the border impose additional costs on importers and exporters of goods, um, there will be additional costs for consumers. And those costs will probably be absorbed um, in terms of the overall economy by an adjustment of the exchange rate, which means people will find that they've got a um, little bit less purchasing power in their pocket um, uh, uh, as a result of those exchange rate movements. You might remember that in the autumn of 2016, after the Brexit vote, sterling depreciated about 10% against the US dollar and the euro um, and gradually recovered some of that ground. But um, for a short while, there was a spike in UK inflation. And I think there's a possibility that that would happen again. I know you feel that whether we leave with or without a deal, it's a lose-lose for the UK. Can you maybe quantify where those losses are going to be most felt? Yeah, I think we've got um, we've got two choices and they're, they're difficult ones and um, we don't have to make the decision because it'll be made for us by the working of the market economy. Um, we either see if, if Britain um, doesn't have access to the European market on the same basis, um, we will either see British businesses decline um, in, in, and lose their competitiveness and thus 
um, decline in scale of operations because of that, or we will see the exchange rate adjust to um, absorb that change in the terms of trade um, and British workers through their wages absorbing those additional costs. The, the Treasury analysis suggested that um, having no deal um, would cost something like 8%, 7, 8% of our GDP. Leaving with a deal like the one that's been being negotiated now will have a much smaller impact, but there will still be some costs through additional frictions uh, at the borders, perhaps two or three percent um, of GDP, which is not terminal, but it's also not pleasant. And is there anything that can be done at this stage to mitigate any of the damage that's coming our way? Well, get the best deal that we can and then engage um, immediately and um, wholeheartedly with the EU in talking about building that deal, enhancing that deal. Let me give a specific example. Financial services will be able to continue on January the 1st, 2021. I, I have no doubt about um, that. Uh, if we do any kind of trade deal at all, even though it doesn't cover financial services. But the difference between uh, the EU then moving fairly quickly to insist on the relocation of financial services businesses to the EU, as opposed to the EU taking a more relaxed view and allowing that process to happen over a much longer time frame, will depend on the relationship between the governments, between the UK government and the European Union and the principal governments in the European Union. So uh, Boris Johnson talks all the time about our friends in Europe. Um, there's a lot of stress on that relationship at the moment because of the negotiations. Once it's done, if we do a deal, then he needs to put into practice um, that rhetoric of uh, friendship and make sure that we do go forward with a very positive and, and um, uh, friendly uh, approach uh, to our European neighbours, trying to build on whatever deal we do so that we can um, protect the British economy and protect the living standards of British workers to the maximum extent possible. Well, you mentioned financial services sector. We've had this question in from somebody watching the webinar asking why hasn't the financial services sector been a higher priority in the negotiation of the deal? And of course, it's the lifeblood of the city financial services. Yes, and the uh, simple answer is that the Europeans have always been clear that if we want access to um, the European finan wholesale financial services market, um, we would have to accept the European financial services regulatory regime um, with all its um, complexities, although many of them were British designed, of course, because we've been a very active um, participant in um, building the European financial services regulatory um, regimes. The British government, uh, for better or for worse, decided that it was not prepared to submit to a, re to a re regulatory regime written in Brussels and Frankfurt and policed by, inevitably, by the European uh, Courts of Justice. Uh, and therefore, it, it has never asked under this government, under the Johnson government, it has never asked, as far as I'm aware, for a deal on financial services. Um, the British government's ask has simply been that we should be given access. Um, it hasn't been prepared to negotiate a deal um, that would see British financial services regulated as they are today, by European Union financial services legislation. We had another question in. This one asks, which industries and sectors might thrive in a post-COVID and Brexit world? Yeah, well, there will be some opportunities, of course, um, for um, import substitution, for example, where um, uh, it, it, uh, flows of imports is disrupted or imports become uh, more expensive. Um, there will be uh, opportunities. Um, it's a trivial example, but there's a huge um, business in cut flowers um, being exported from the Netherlands to the UK on a daily basis. Trucks leaving um, the central Netherlands in the early hours of the morning and arriving uh, on the streets of our cities nine, ten o'clock in the morning. Um, that business model may not work anymore because of the extra time that customs controls at the borders um, introduce into the process and the additional regulation and inspection that there will have to be for agricultural produce, which includes um, flowers. 
And it may be that there are opportunities, for example, for people growing flowers under glass in East Anglia to um, uh, to take on some of that market. But the um, the consequences are already clear. They will be more expensive um, and consumers will have to pay more because if they weren't more expensive, they'd already have the market. Um, so uh, there will be some opportunities. There will be some changes. Um, I think the industries that are going to be most affected are the um, big regulated industries in the service sector, financial services, um, but not in the very short term for the reasons I've explained. Um, in the manufacturing sector, um, chemicals, um, where the British chemicals industry based in the Northeast uh, has a lot of exports to Europe, which will be much more difficult uh, under a regime which doesn't recognise um, UK certifications and um, um, uh, mutual qualifications. And another question about the UK post Brexit asking, could the UK survive with its Commonwealth allies? Just how important are those Commonwealth links to trade? Um, of course, uh, doing deals with Commonwealth countries is um, attractive. Um, I did a webinar um, in Australia um, last week talking about the UK-Australia trade deal. And of course, it would be great to have a trade deal with Australia, but nobody should ever kid themselves that even if we did trade deals with all the English speaking countries um, in the world, apart from the United States, um, that would go anywhere near um, uh, replacing the trade um, we would expect to lose as a result of not having a trade deal with the European Union. Of course, if we are able to get a trade deal with the European Union and minimize the reduction in the scale of trade between Britain and the EU, and at the same time, add on deals with Canada, with Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and so on, um, that's all to the good. And if we can do a deal with the United States eventually, um, that could also be beneficial. Although we have to remember that a trade deal is a two-way pipe. Goods flow in both directions. It's not just about British exports. It's also about all those very productive and efficient American producers with their very low energy costs and their very low raw materials costs having free access to our markets and what that might do to British producers of products like wooden furniture, um, where US input costs are far lower uh, than those experienced in Europe. Well, let's talk about the US and the future UK-US trade relationship, something much talked about. And you mentioned this fear mm. of chlorinated chicken, amongst others. What do you think or who do you think would be better placed for the UK, Donald Trump or Joe Biden, in terms of a future trading relationship? Um, well, look, um, I'm, uh, I'm a, a private citizen now, so I can express a view. Um, I think that it is um, probably in the world's best interest uh, that we move on now and have a change of administration in the US. Um, I'm not sure that so many of the Biden policies, for example, in relation to trade policy with China, will be so different from the Trump um, policies, but I think they will probably be delivered in a very different style um, and in a very different way. And um, there are many things that you can do that have an effect but how you do them can have an additional effect. And if you do them aggressively, um, uh, it makes for a much worse outcome than if you do the same thing diplomatically. And I think um, a Biden administration might well uh, mean that elements of the world, uh, the multilateral system, the world uh, trading system and security system um, that are under extreme pressure at the moment um, may uh, stand a lot more chance of um, surviving and even thriving in the future. OK, well, we will find out in three weeks time, won't we? we will indeed. And just before I let you go, one last question, a bit mm. more personal. As you said, you are a private citizen now. It's been obviously a torrid time for the current chancellor and um, trying to prop up so many people's livelihoods and businesses over the past six months. And mm. that's not going away. And of course, then we've got whatever the outcome is from this Brexit trade deal. Are you quite pleased, really, that you are all out of it now and you're not Chancellor? <laughs> well, I don't think any former Chancellor is ever going to say that because being away from the heart of power is never um, attractive. But look, the current Chancellor, I'm very pleased to say, was able to deploy the firepower needed to protect the economy in the short term, precisely because we took the measures 
over the last 10 years to rebuild Britain's public finances from the disaster of 2007-8. And I'm delighted that he was able uh, to um, use that firepower to protect people and businesses. But in a sense, um, he's had a he's had a good war so far, but he's done the easy bit. Um, uh, giving away money, in my experience, is quite a lot easier than persuading people to part with it and give it back to you. And I think um, from his next budget, whenever he decides to deliver it, um, he's going to have to start um, telling people the difficult truth uh, that, that all of this has to be paid for. Now, it won't be paid for all at once. It will be paid for over a long uh, period of time, but it's going to have to be paid for to some extent by um, lower levels of um, public service delivery, uh, to some extent by higher taxes. Um, and that isn't going to be welcome news to anybody, but I'm sure for the moment, the Chancellor will just want to focus on getting us through this next um, um, wave of COVID um, before we go into uh, looking at that. But I think uh, Rishi Sunak's life is likely to become a lot more difficult over the next few months than it was over the past six months. Okay, Philip Hammond, thank you so much for your time thank and for you. your fascinating insights and your frankness and openness as well. It's been so fascinating to hear your thoughts about the future UK-EU relationship and a lot more will become clearer in the coming days and weeks. And also thank you very much to the London Speaker Bureau for hosting this webinar. And of course, thank you to all of our viewers for watching and for your questions and wishing you all a great day. Thank you.